for those watching and listening, thank you uh, for spending another uh, Sunday here with us. We know you have several options, um, and so we are blessed um, that you've decided to check us out, and we hope that uh, in return we're, we bless you. So uh, stick around for the entire message. There might be something there for you. I definitely believe that. So today is a special day because we are in the last chapter of 2 Samuel. And I've titled today's message, Never Too Late to Turn Around. Now, I wish I could tell you that the author, historian, closes 2 Samuel with a happy ending, but he doesn't. The author doesn't end 2 Samuel that way. And one reason could be that he possibly knows that uh, David's story doesn't end here. It's just his part, uh, just his part of, of telling this, his story. And so, again, this story does continue in, in First Chronicles and I think also in, in First Kings. Um, First Chronicles mostly, but there you will find... The event, all the events leading up to David's death. Now, in this final chapter that we're going to be covering today, I'm going to break it down into three parts. In the first part, we're going to see King David make a terrible decision based on an emotional reaction. In the second part, we're going to read about the consequences that resulted from the resulted uh, from the punishment that he was given to choose from. And then in the last part, we're going to look at the steps he took to show how sincerely he was sorry for blowing it so badly. Before we cover it, though. It's important to understand here, again, that there, a parallel narrative about this event is given in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Uh, the reason you need to know this is because 1 Chronicles names Satan, not God, as the one who incited David to his foolish decision. Now, when we get there, I'll explain why this isn't a contradiction as some would like to point out, and I'll, again, I'll explain why that is. What this chapter, what Second Samuel chapter 24 will hopefully show you is what a heart of repentance looks like after recognizing and admitting that you've messed up, that you've blown it, that you've sinned greatly. And ultimately, it will show you that it's, regardless of how bad it is, it's never too late to turn around. Yes, you may have to deal with some consequences as a result result of blowing it badly. But God will still forgive you. He will still love you. He will still hold you in His arms. You will still be a child of God. You're... In his eyes, you're not irredeemable. He wants you to come to him with a heart of repentance, and he will forgive you. So before I begin reading the final chapter again here, it's, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Heavenly Father, you are so wonderful and so good and, and amazing, and we are thankful that you've given us uh, such a beautiful day here in the last Sunday of October. We pray that you will pour your spirit now upon this place, upon this room as we now read your word as it's spoken aloud and as I deliver the message that you helped me to prepare, Lord. Speak powerfully to those that are here, those that are watching and listening. Lord, 
I know and believe that you, your word has the power to change lives, to convict, to, to just bring people to their knees in order to seek your forgiveness. So if that's what people need now, right now, Lord, those that are here or watching, I pray that you will do that mightily. Pour your Holy Spirit here upon us now, Lord. Remove all distractions. And may your word penetrate our hearts, Lord, deeply. We love you and praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Second Samuel, chapter 24, verse 1. And the word of God says, The Lord's anger burned against Israel again, and he stirred up David against them to say, Go count the people of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of his army, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and register the troops so I can know their number. Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times more than they are, while my Lord the King looks on. But why does my Lord the King want to do this? Yet the King's order prevailed over Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army left the King's presence to register the troops of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and camped at Ar Aror south of the town in the middle of the valley, and then proceeded towards, toward Gad and Jazer. They went to Gilead and to the land of the Hittites and continued to Danjan and around to Sidon. They went to the fortress of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Afterwards, they went to the Negev of Judah and at Beersheba. When they had gone through the whole land, they returned to Jerusalem. At the end of nine months and 20 days, Joab gave the king the total of the registration of the troops. There were 800,000 valiant armed men from Israel and 500,000 men from Judah. David's conscience troubled him after he had taken the census of the troops. He said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Now, Lord, please, I've been very I've been very foolish. Please take away your servant's guilt. Now, right from the onset, I want to point out two things that are difficult to determine in this chapter. First, because chapter 22 and through 24 weren't written in chronological order, Bible historians and commentators haven't been able to really pinpoint when the events uh, of this story take place. Some have suggested that this took place sometime after David captured Jerusalem in, in chapter 5. Um, and, but before he brought the ark to the holy city in chapter 6. While others have said that it took place prior to David's instructions to Solomon about building the temple in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now, uh, either one of these makes sense and they're pretty logical in regards to, you know, what, uh, when this could have been, uh, when these events could have happened. But regardless of when it occurred, it doesn't really change the story itself, nor does a does it affect the purpose it was recorded and documented? The second thing the story isn't clear about is the reason why the Lord's anger burned against Israel again. Now, there are several incidences prior to this that Israel's sinful pride and self-reliance had caused God's anger to burn against them. We see several examples of that during the Exodus. So although it's not specifically stated, their sin became such a problem that it couldn't be ignored anymore and it had to be dealt with. 
But again, just to give you an example of what happens when the Lord anger, when the Lord's anger does burn, let me read to you the last time that these words are mentioned. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, When Uzzah reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it because it had because the oxen had stumbled, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah. And God struck him dead on the spot for his irreverence. Now, verse 1 also states that God stirred up David to count the people. However, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 names Satan as a culprit. Is this, as some have said, a contradiction? Well, not at all, since both can be true. See, it's quite possible that God permitted Satan to tempt David in order to accomplish the purposes that he had in mind. Now, throughout the Old Testament, throughout Old Testament history, Satan often, often employed various methods to oppose God's people. But this is one of four instances in the Old Testament where Satan is named specifically and seen openly at work. The other three are when he tempted Eve in Genesis chapter 3, when he attacked Job in Job chapter 1 and 2, and when he accused Joshua, the high priest, in Zechariah chapter 3. So although we know that uh, what prompted David to take this action, verse 1 doesn't state the reason why he specifically chose to take a census. Now, according to Exodus chapter 30 and Numbers chapter 3, take it, taking a census is permittable for the right reasons and if the guidelines that are specified are followed. However, this doesn't appear the case here. The fact that he only had Military men counted in verse 2 suggest that he was only interested in determining his military strength. And if this was the reason why, and if the reason, and if his reason was to boast about the size of his army, then that's where he would have sinned. Joab, the commander of his army. This is, again, probably before he you know, started killing all these people, um, knew David. He knew David very well. He kind of understood him, and he was, almost knew him like the back of his hand. And he knew that David was making a terrible mistake, and he tried to object. He first told the king that God was able to multiply the troop as much as necessary. So why, he then asked, does my lord, the king, want to do this? See, for Joab, the census reflected a shift in David's object of faith from alliance on Yahweh to win battles to a reliance on the strength of his military might. He was concerned that David was acting like one of the pagan kings that they were surrounded by, rather than an Israelite king who trusted in the one and true living God. But when David failed to respond, when he remained silent, when he didn't give an answer to Joab's question, Joab realized that he had pretty much made his mind and that he couldn't be dissuaded. So yes, David issued the order, and Joab and the commanders followed it, and proceeded to register the troops of Israel. Well, as we see, it took nine months and 20 days to go through the entire land. And when they finally returned back to Jerusalem, the king was given the final report of their count. The end of verse 9 says that there were 800,000 valiant men from Israel and 500,000 men 
from Judah. But here's the kicker. After receiving the report, David realized that he had messed up and was immediately struck with guilt. His sin of pride and self-sufficiency was now plainly apparent to him. He felt convicted for what he had done. And this goes to show that even a man after God's heart was still susceptible to sin. But he had a heart sensitive to sin when it was committed. He had the Holy Spirit living in him. He was filled. We know that he was filled with the Spirit when he did sin, when he did commit the sin, rather than wallowing in guilt and carrying that burden of conviction around day after day, month after month, year after year, rather than saying, you know what, I deserve this pain. I deserve feeling this way. You know what? It's over. I'm horrible. I'm, gonna, I'm never going to make it as a king. Rather than having that kind of attitude or reaction, he confessed his sin to the Lord. He did it right away. He acknowledged that he had been very foolish and then asked him to remove the guilt that he felt. Now, I want to pause here for a bit to show you how important verse 10 is. Keep in mind, David understood and realized that he blew it. David was convicted of his sin because he was filled with God's spirit. And this made him sensitive, as I said, to his sinful behavior. Now, conviction can be good. It's good. You know why? Because it, it's a good sign. It pretty much tells you that you have the Holy Spirit living in you. If you're doing something wrong, doing something that you're, that you're not supposed to be doing and you're not convicted of it, you don't feel that you've sinned against God, then there's something going on there with your heart and maybe you haven't really truly surrendered your heart to him and even possibly you may not have had or may not have the Holy Spirit really living in you but even if you accidentally take a pen you're going to feel guilty about it you're not going to feel right about it there one time I took my daughter to go get a burrito at a at a store and I accidentally took their pen when they gave me the paper to sign and the receipt to sign and I didn't realize until I got home I was like oh my goodness I took this pen for most it would have been it wouldn't have been a big deal it's a pen but for me I did I you know honestly I know it sounds silly but I felt bad about it and so I wanted I personally wanted to 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 do something about it but I also just wanted to show my daughter you know the right thing to do so I wasn't able to do it right then and there but then the following time we went to get a burrito at that place um, I said here's your pen I'm sorry I took it <laughs> you know but that conviction was there you know and I'm just talking about a small I guess sin even though all sin is the same but same is true when it comes to the lust in your heart the murder in your heart you're not going to feel right for sinning. And again, if you don't feel that way, then maybe you don't have really the Holy Spirit living in you. Now, when you have blown it and are convicted about it, what do we see David doing when he felt this way? He acknowledged and confessed his sin. He said, yeah, you know, I've been foolish. I've messed up. I've blown it. I'm sorry. Take this guilt away from me. 
And so if you're here today and you've made a horrible decisions or decisions, it's never too late to turn around. It's never too late to ask for forgiveness. It's never too late to confess those sins, to acknowledge to God that you've blown it and to confess those sins. Let me read to you what it says in Psalm, what David wrote in Psalm chapter 32. And this is how he felt when it came to the sin in his heart and confessing it. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7. There, David writes, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity and whose spirit and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately. When great flood waters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from terror, from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. David understood what it meant to blow it. And he's now telling you what you have to do when you've blown it. Confess your sins immediately. Acknowledge, confess your sins immediately to God. Acknowledge what you've done. Now, once you confess your sin, ask him to remove your guilt. Ask God to remove your guilt by seeking forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever you've done, He will forgive you. The Lord will take away that burden. The Lord will take away that guilt, that conviction that's in your heart. He will cleanse you and he will heal you and he will make you right. And that relationship will be restored once again that was broken because of your sin. Don't let anyone convince you that you have to do a certain amount of prayers they have to do a certain amount of works. No. You simply do what David did here. Come to the Lord, confess, and ask him to forgive you. And we just, as I just read, he will forgive you. Now, confession, acknowledgement, and yes, even forgiveness doesn't mean that there won't be consequences for making stupid decisions. And so in the next section, we're going to see the heavy toll that David had to pay for his sin. So let's go there now and read that, that section there. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. When David got up in the morning, the word of the Lord had come to the prophet Gad, David's seer. Go and say to David, this is what the Lord says. I am offering you three choices. Choose one of them and I will do it to you. So Gad went to David, told him the choices and asked him, do you want three years of famine to come to your land? To flee from your foes three months while they pursue you? Or to have a plague in your land three days? Now consider carefully what answer I should take back to the one who sent me. David answered Gad, I have great anxiety. Please let us fall into the Lord's hands because his mercies are great. 
but don't let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men died. Then the angel extended his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it. But the Lord relented concerning the destruction and said to the angel who, would destroy, who was destroying the people, Enough. Withdraw your hand now. The angel of the Lord was then at the, tre- was then at the threshing floor at Arura, Aruna, the Jebusite. When David saw the angel striking the people, he said to the Lord, Look, I am the one who has sinned. I am the one who has done this wrong, who has done wrong. Please, but the sheep, what have they done? Please, let your hand be against me and my father's family. So, just as... We saw in the previous section, David did do the right thing by confessing his sin and asking for forgiveness. Now, at least three times in Scripture, we find David confessing, I have sinned. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and 24 and in 17 and in Psalm 41 and 51 and in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now, in 2 Samuel Chapter 12, verse 13, when he confessed his sin of adultery and murder, David said, I have sinned. But in our story, when he confessed his sin of numbering the people, he said, I have sinned greatly. Now, I think most of us would consider his sin relating to Bathsheba far worse than the sin of just numbering the people in the land. And we'll probably say that it was much, his sin with Bathsheba was much more foolish. But here's the thing, when David finally realized that what he had done, he understood, he finally understood the enormity of it. See, David's sins with Bathsheba took the lives of four of David's sons, the baby, Ammon, Absalom, and Adonisha, plus the life of Uriah. However, after the census, God sent a plague that took the lives of 70,000 people. It appears that the Lord must have agreed with David that he indeed sinned greatly. Also, after David sinned with Bathsheba, that was a sin of the flesh, yielding to lust after an afternoon of laziness. But the sin, but the senses was a sin of the spirit, a willful act of rebellion against God that was motivated by pride. Now, in case you didn't know, according to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, pride is, n- is number one on the list there of the sins that God hates. Jonathan Jonathan Edwards said this about pride. Pride is the worst viper in the heart. It is the first sin that ever entered into the universe. It lies lowest of all the foundation of the whole building of sin. Of all lust, it is the most secret, deceitful, and unsearchable in its ways of working. It is ready to mix with everything. Nothing is so hateful to God contrary to the spirit of the gospel or of or of of so dangerous consequence there is no one sin that does so much to let the devil into the hearts of the saints and expose them to his delusions pride my friends is dangerous be mindful of that be aware of that be careful can strike when you don't expect it, when you least expect it, when you didn't even realize it. And when you've really blown it, when you've sinned because of that pride, that conviction will also strike. And it's not going to be a good feeling. Now, the 
Bible makes it makes a clear distinction between sudden sins committed by passions such as anger and lust and willful sins of rebellion and treat and treats the guilty parties of those sins differently. Again, what David did was willful rebellion and he did it against God who is the light of truth and who also exposes that sin plainly. Furthermore, God gave David over nine months to repent. But again, because of his stubbornness, he wouldn't budge in the various scenes in David's history. Joab doesn't come across as a godly man. But even Joab was opposed to this project. And it appears that so were his officers. David should have heeded their counsel, but his stubbornness kept him from listening to what God was trying to tell him through the words of those men around him. Friends, let me share with you an important truth that 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says. And there it says that God, in His grace, forgives our sins when we confess them. However, this is also true. Because of His righteous nature, He allows us to reap the consequences of those bad decisions. You know, there's a lot of people around you, good Christians around you that are warning you, that are trying to tell you, stay away from that, stay away from this, don't listen to that person, don't watch this, don't listen to that. And you may think that they're just putting restrictions on you, that they're just putting burdens on you, but really they're saying it many times out of love and concern maybe from their own experience, experiences. Take time to listen. Maybe seek the advice and opinion of other Christians to see what they say. But the Lord will use other people to speak to you plainly of what you shouldn't do, what you should stay away from, what your actions are leading to. Listen carefully, listen well, open your ears. And when, he, and when you do listen and you find out that, hey, they were right, then give, give all the glory to God. Don't tell that person, just give all the glory to God for using that person to speak to you personally. Now, in this particular instance, the Lord gave David the privilege of choosing the consequences. Why? Because David's dis disobedience was a sin of the will, a deliberate choice on David's part. So God allowed him to make another choice and name the punishment. And so God gave the king three choices and told him to consider them, consider them carefully, to make a decision, and to give his answer when the prophet returned between the first, that first and second visit of, of, of Gad, David must have sought the face of the Lord. For God lowered the famine period from seven, and this is again according to First Chronicles chapter 21, he lowered the famine period from seven years to three years, which explains why there's a difference between those two numbers in those two chapters. So in his mercy... God shortened the days of the suffering for his chosen people. And that's why he knew that God, uh, David knew that God was a merciful God. So that's why he chose that one. That's why he chose that punishment. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, these three punishments are also named in God's covenant with Israel. So David really shouldn't be surprised that he had to choose from famine, military defeat, or a plague. But David also, like I say, as I said, knew the mercy of the Lord. So he wisely chose the plague for his punishment. Now it's unknown the kind of plague, what kind of plague this was. 
But what we do know, what we do know is that it started the next day in the morning and continued for three days and that a total of 70,000 men died. And just as Joab and his men had ended their mission, their objective there in Jerusalem, the angel of the Lord was to complete his work in that city by destroying the people there. But it says in verse 16, that the Lord relented concerning the destruction and said to the angel, enough, withdraw your hand now. It also says in that verse that because David had a shepherd's heart, it broke him. It broke him emotionally and it broke his heart to see all that death and destruction. So he pleaded with all his might with the Lord. He pleaded to the Lord to punish him instead, that those people didn't deserve it. Now, there's a lot of wrong things about our society. A lot of wrong things you may say is like wrong about our country and so much evilness. But if you're thinking and you want the Lord to come down now and, or an angel of the Lord to destroy everything, to kill millions of people because they deserve it, there's something, again, all wrong with you. Because a true heart doesn't want a true heart, a true uh, a heart that has that knows Jesus, that knows the heart has a heart of a shepherd, will not want to see these lives being destroyed and ending up in hell. You should never wish hell on anyone. Instead, you should seek the re that they re repent of their sins and come to the, know the Lord. That ought to be your prayer. Those, are, those ought to be your thoughts in regards to our society and our nation as well. At this nation, the people of this nation will humble themselves and seek the Lord and to come to the Lord so that there will be revival that more people will come and enter into his kingdom. Shouldn't wish hell, death or hell on anyone. And those advocating for that, again, I recommend not listening to them. That's not the spirit of the Lord. Now, in case you're wondering why God would kill 70,000 men and yet keep David alive, all you have to do is go back to verse 1. There it clearly states that God was angry with Israel, not with David. So he must have been punishing the people for a grievous, a great sin that they committed. Yes, David sinned, but his punishment was seeing all those people getting killed. He had a choice to make. But the Lord was angry with Israel for what they had done. Now, some commentators have suggested that this plague may have taken the lives of the Israelites who had followed Absalom in his rebellion and didn't want David as their king. Now, this certainly is a possibility. But we have to be careful here because the text, because the text doesn't tell us this is only speculation. And we can speculate all we want, but we can't, you know, read too much into it and make, you know, decide what it, the Bible is actually saying. Now, one other thing I want you to keep in mind and notice, and that's how David received the word of the Lord. And that's through the prophet Gad. See, the Lord, as I mentioned earlier, he will use his people 
to speak truth into the lives of the disobedient. And maybe you're watching this right now and these words I'm saying, it's, it's not feeling too great. Well, I'm delivering to you the word of the Lord. And he's the one doing the conviction. If indeed you have are being convicted. Listen, he, again, he, he may be using me to share this with you in order for you to come back to him. And if, it's, and if that's what he's doing, do it as quickly as possible. Come back to it. It's never too late to turn around. We can get more into that, but I want to try to get to this last section. Um, well, in the final section of this chapter and book, we're going to see what uh, David did to show how sorry he was for the horrible decision or the horrible choices he made. So let's turn again one last time to 2 Samuel and read from verse 18 all the way to the end. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18. Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Araunah, Ara the Jebusite. David went up in obedience to, God's, to Gad's command, just as the Lord had commanded. Ara, Araunah looked down and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So he went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. Araunah said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David replied, To buy the, thresh, the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the lord. So the plague on my people may be halted. Arauna said to David, My lord the king may take whatever he wants and offer it. Here are the oxen for a burnt offering and the threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Your majesty, Aranua, gives everything here to the king. Then he said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. The king answered, Aruna, I know I insist in buying it from you for a price, for I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that costs me nothing. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 20 ounces of silver. He built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord was receptive to prayer for the land and the plague on Israel ended. Now it appears when this section begins that God's wrath had been momentarily held back but now, sin had to be dealt with through atonement. So once again, the prophet Gad shows up. This time, he has a message of hope. David was instructed to build an altar on, um, on Aruna's threshing floor. And excuse me about the, again, I'm probably butchering the name there, but and there offer sacrifices to the Lord, and the plague would cease. As King David could have appropriated the property, or even borrowed it, but he insisted on purchasing it. See, David knew the high cost of sinning and refused to give the Lord something that cost him nothing. So for 50 shekels of silver, he purchased the oxen for sacrifices, and wooden yokes for fuel. And for 600 shekels of gold, he purchased the entire threshing floor. When the priests, when the priests offered the sacrifices, God sent fire from heaven to consume them as token of his acceptance. And although that's not stated here, that again is all that is also stated in First Chronicles chapter 21. What's interesting about the land that David purchased is that it wasn't just some ordinary piece of property. Now listen carefully because this is probably going to blow some of your minds. See, according to Genesis chapter 22, 
it was the place where Abraham had put his son Isaac on the altar and where Solomon would eventually build the temple. After the plague ceased, David concentrated the site to the consecrated the site to the Lord and used it as a place of sacrifice and worship. Although the population had been depleted by 70,000, the whole country had been giving had been given sanctuary. A, a, I'm sorry, the whole country had been given a salutary reminder of this spiritual reality. True prosperity was to be found in dependence upon their faithful covenant, Lord, and on Him alone. Now, if you were asked to name David's greatest two sins, you, now you probably would reply that it was his adultery with Bathsheba and his here, his numbering of the people. And you would be right. But out of those two great sins, God built a temple. Bathsheba gave birth to Solomon and God chose him to succeed David on the throne. On the property David purchased and on which he erected an altar, Solomon as I said, built the temple and dedicated it to the glory of God. And today, a lot of people say that there's, there's some debate about it, but a lot of people say that right now that place still exists and it's being occupied by a Muslim shrine. And you probably might have heard of it. It's called the Dome of the Rock. Furthermore, I believe that it'll probably be uh, location, the location of where the, new temp, where the new temple will be built during the tribulation period, and also where the millennial temple will be built during Christ's reign on earth. However, here's the thing. Uh, I want to make sure that I also mention this. What God did for David is certainly not an excuse for sin. Because David paid dearly for committing those sins or for committing that sin. However, knowing what God did for David does encourage us to seek his face and trust his grace when we've disobeyed him. Let me read to you what it says in Romans chapter 5 verse 20. Where sin is multiplied, grace is multiplied even more. Friends, truly what a merciful God we have. Well, as I sum up these two books, first and Sam, second Samuel are perfect examples of how the scriptures are completely honest in their treatment of their heroes of faith. Yes, David had his faults, but they're mentioned alongside his faith. We've followed David from the flock through exile into exaltation. Few men walked closer to God. Few men fell deeper into sin. But through it all, through all of that, he was sustained by the Lord. We have benefit, benefited from the experiences that David passed through because he recorded them in the Psalms. Matthew Henry said this about David as he appears in Samuel and how he appears in, Psalm, in the Psalms. Many things in, in his history are very instructive. For the hero who is the subject of it, though in many instances he appears here uh, very great and very good and very much the favorite of heaven, yet it must be confessed that his honor shines brighter in Psalms than in his annals, which is these history books. Now, I also want to share with you some words from Psalm 40, which I think fitly summarize David's life. And there, in Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, David writes, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me, out, he brought me up from a desolate pit, out of the muddy clay, 
and set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and hear and, and fear, and they will trust in the Lord. As I've said many times throughout this book, someone greater than David will eventually come who will save all of God's people from their sins. He would, he, he would be a descendant of David, but will be much more greater, greater than David himself, more than a man and more and one who was without sin. He would be the Lord Jesus Christ who came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He would come to live a sin, sinless life and to die a sacrificial death in the place of the sinner. He would be delivered from death as God the Father raised him from the dead. He would return as king in Israel, triumphing over his enemies. Samuel simply whets our appetites for the coming of the king who will save his people from their sins. So now as we leave the book of Samuel, our eyes are fixated on the person of Jesus Christ who, is to, who has come to save his people as the son of David, who will sit on the throne of his father, David. Our eyes are likewise fixed on a place on a, on a flat spot on a mountain near Jerusalem. You see, I picture the image of the angel of the Lord standing there with his uplifted arm, ready to smite Jerusalem with his sword. But I cannot help but to think back to Abraham, who also lifted, who also had his hand lifted up ready to plunge the knife into his beloved son, Isaac. There and here, God stayed the hand from taking the life because he had a better sacrifice, one that would take away the sin of the world. Yes, a temple would eventually be built on that very spot, on Mount Moriah, and their sacrifices would, uh, would be given, the blood sacrifices would be offered to atone for the people's sins. But best of all, it was on a hill, not far away at all, Mount Calvary, where the hand of God came down on his own beloved son. And because of his sacrifice, men never need suffer the eternal wrath of God for their sins. It was because of his sacrificial death on that cross and his resurrection from the dead, saved by the Father, raised by the Spirit, that the offer of eternal salvation has come to all of us. So let me ask you, have you, re have you received this? gift? Have you received this gift that God has personally offered to you? Have you found God, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your Savior, your Deliverer, as your rock, as your fortress? If not, I urge you, before you leave today, before you click out of this video, to do that, to accept his gift of salvation today. The Lord right now is giving you that opportunity because you don't know what's going to happen when you walk out these doors. You don't know what's going to happen when you, five seconds after you turn off this video or stop listening to this message, But one thing you can know is your eternal salvation. 
you can know for sure that you will be eternally saved by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, by coming to Him on the cross, at the cross, and confessing your sin, acknowledging your sin, confessing it, and asking for forgiveness. And so if that's what, you've li- that's what you want to do, and in the moment I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Him, but also if you've blown it as a Christian and you've back- backslidden and you've walked away from the Lord, it's never too late to come back. His arms have always been out there, outstretched, waiting for you to come back into into His arms. He loves you. He cares for you. And He wants to forgive you. So, wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes, bow your head, And with all sincerity, with all your heart, pray this to Jesus on the cross. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done foolish foolish things. And I ask that you remove my guilt. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept your forgiveness. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill my heart with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born again life so that I may be sensitive to those wrongs, to those sins, Lord, and, and turn away from them. And thank you for what you've done for me. In your name, amen. If you've prayed that, let us know. We want to hear about it. We want to maybe pray with you some more. We want to lead you, help lead you into your next steps of your Christian walk. We can give you a Bible, send you a Bible. Um, if you're watching this and you want, you're not sure what what kind of church you ought to go to, you can give us a call or send us a message and we maybe can send you, give you a list of churches nearby in your area where you'll definitely be taught the Word of God. Where you are not going to get, you know, things aren't going to get sugar-coated and you're not going to get a concert and you're not going to get, you know, uh, just a positive message. Um, and so we want to help you with that. Let us know. If you're here in the area, we want to, again, open we our doors are open to you we're in the corner of gateway south and um, hondo pass thank you for watching this morning i hope they have a blessed week and uh, let's be the light of god today and every day god bless you have a great week we love you goodbye Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message this morning. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.